Okay, good morning. Thank you, everybody. So, as Professor Tamieto said, we are now entering the first general discussion for uh, the next hour, next half an hour, sorry. And so, I suppose that you have many uh, remarks and questions about what you heard during these talks. And if you want to start with from the public, if you have any question, please. Um, so I have a question for Marco Tamietto. You were trying to look at a different forms of emotion, evolutionarily old um, and new. Um, there should be something else that fundamentally distinguishes computationally what you can do with a visual cortex, early visual areas, and without. And what we think we know is that you're forming combinations of features in the early parts of the visual cortex. So there should be f something fundamental to be discovered there about the difference between blind sight and normal sight in relation to feature combinations. And I wonder if you'd like to comment on that, Mark, and maybe other speakers will later on when they give their talks. But just to give an illustration of this, this is, a, I think, a comment I made to Marco and to Larry before. What would happen if you had face expression and you tried to recognize a face expression upside down? Now, you know, with the Thatcher illusion and so on, it doesn't work properly. You can't tell the face expression. And so that should be pretty configuration sensitive. So do you have anything to say, Marco, or perhaps anyone else who's here about that? Is there any evidence that configuration a sort of processing is somewhat different in blind sight. But I'm not aware which is in fact a, uh, a pity. That, well, I know that Bear, Bear can comment more than me, but I'm not too aware of the standard use in blind sight of this reversal presentation, which is common in, for example, in, in the study of patients with prosopagnosia that the inversion disrupts, the, the glo let's say, what is called the global processing of faces. But Lara Bea has done some studies in, in, in prosopagnosic patients. I don't think you, you ever did studies with the same technique in, in, in blind sight, but please go ahead. You did? Okay, sorry. <laughs> As a biographer, I'm not that good. We did exactly that and, and many more uh, manipulations in the very first behavioral paper, the 99 paper, which you referred to. So we, we invert, we put the stimulus. Actually, at that time, things were pretty simple. What we did was put the monitor upside down. <laughs> That's one thing. We played, uh, we played the study. Actually, people forget that in the very first study, we used small video clips. Um, so we could, we could, of course, we also played, played the video clip for, for uh, backward forward, that one. And, and we did one which I liked particularly. We did a manipulation where the force of choice we gave to the patients were actually fo false ones. Rather than making him choose between the two emotions that were actually displayed, we said this time the choices are gonna be between, not between A and B, between C and D. And, uh, and that the, interestingly, uh, GY absolutely didn't like to do that. He didn't say anything. He hadn't seen the stimuli before. But he said, mm, do I have to do more of that? And sorry, Bea, wh what about, the, what it, about a, uh, presenting the faces upside down then destroy the effect? Ah. That was what I was going to prompt Bea for. So you no longer get the difference between the face expressions when they're upside down, which is then, you know, it's an important experiment that you did in 99, because then that tells us there is something sort of computationally quite different about the sort of processing that you can do without early visual cortic cortical areas, which, which, you know, from understanding how the brain works is very important. Well, this prompts very many questions and actually lots more behavioral controls that, uh, that uh, this was at the beginning a sort of naive paper and I'll talk a little bit about this this afternoon. And uh, that was my first paper when it came out of philosophy and I sent it to Neuro Report. I thought, gee, that has Neuro, it has to be a serious journal. <laughs> Just to encourage younger people, that's still the most quoted paper in, uh, in Neuro Report, whatever. But yes, because, I, mean, I would actually see 
not even conclude, but this is bit, 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 a bit perverse, not even conclude that the report was about, that the report was about in any real sense of the perceptual visual system about faces. It was about the distinction between stimuli. Okay, thanks. We have one more question here in the front row. Thank you. Um, thank you, Marco. Very nice uh, talk. Uh, it's a, a, a small question for you. Um, have you ever seen a patient, or are there descriptions of patients uh, with a pure form of affective blind sight? I mean, dissociated from, uh, I don't know, visual well, sight or. <laughs> I, I, I'm happy for the question because we are here, Professor Ladavas, who actually uh, presented two papers, if I remember correctly, one in Cortex and then the other. I don't remember where, of patients with a damage to the visual cortex where amyanopic patient or, or quadrantanopic patient uh, who did not have blind, did not display blind sight in normal testing, but they did have some, some form of affective blind sight or they were able to demonstrate that the presentation of fearful faces, if I remember correctly, were influencing with a, with a redundant target paradigm uh, the, the response to the consciously seen facial expression, but please. Sorry? And, and are there uh, anatomical differences between this kind of patients or? Yeah, in, in, in these patients, what you find in the myanopic patients, you find that just fearful face speed the visual processing in the intact field, okay? And the data are completely different from the one that Bea and Marco found, because they found a congruency effect, which means that when you present the same expression, eh, uh, patients uh, are faster than when the two uh, uh, facial expressions are different, okay? Which means that these patients are able to make a sort of comparison between the two stimuli. Okay? Instead, our patients uh, were not able to make a comparison. Eh? In fact, they, we found an effect only when we had fear, eh? in the amyanopic field. And even more interesting, we didn't find the, uh, the effect when fear was presented in the intact field and another stimulus in the blind field. And uh, we explained this uh, as according to Joseph, the uh, pathways in which uh, uh, um, whether you present fear in the intact field, which means that is a consciousness processing, this processing inhibits completely the unconscious processing performed by the other unconscious root. So the, 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 the effects are completely, completely different. But I wanted to stress the point that our patients are completely unable to so they are at chance level in any specific task, included the emotional task, which means that they, do are, they are not aware at all that something has been presented in the amyanopic field. But nevertheless, fearful uh, face, uh, um, speed, all the visual processing for stimuli presented in the intact field. So, I think they're pretty different. Thank you. We have a more question from the lady there. Professor Issa. Um, I have a question for Professor Rawls. Um, I was very much interested in, uh, in the non-reward neurons involved in depression. Uh, which collaborate or try to collaborate in producing uh, the sadness, more or less, no? if I understood right. No? And uh, I'm interested in, in knowing uh, whether what is known um, or, or supposed, let's say, about uh, 
the behavior of these neurons as far as the mediators they produce or release. No? Because this is very important as the depression is included in this problem. For instance, I just make an, an hypothesis. Um, are they or could they be uh, serotoninergic neurons which are characterized by an increased reuptake of serotonin? Because everybody knows that the inhibitors of serotonin reuptake is one of the most used, let's say, drug no? for, let's say, decrease the sadness of depressed people. Okay, this is a very interesting, uh, uh, in my opinion, field. Thank you. Oh, pardon. So yes, um, what the neurons do is they fire for many seconds um, when you get a non-reward, 10 seconds or more, okay? So that's important because it puts you in a state of sadness or frustrative non-reward so that that can influence your future behavior. Now, um, <clears throat> how do treatments for depression affect that system? That's your question with 5-HT and so on. So the first thing is that this is an attractor theory of depression. In other words, there's a cortical circuit in the lateral orbitofrontal cortex that has positive feedback between the neurons to keep them active for a certain period. So what we think is that treatments for depression should try to knock you out of that positive feedback attractor. So one of the things that does fit with that, possibly, is ketamine. So if you block NMDA receptors with ketamine, um, you produce an antidepressant effect. In a sense, that may be working because it knocks the lateral orbitofrontal cortex out of its continuing activity by reducing the positive feedback in it. And we have models of that. Now, it's not quite clear whether that's exactly how ketamine produces its effect because there's some recent pharmacology saying that there's a metabolite of, ketap of ketamine that may also be important. But that's one way to think about it. The same could be true for 5-HT. So 5-HT affects things like GABA and so on. And so we would be saying that it's because it alters the stability of one of these positive feedback systems that then 5-HD may be having its antidepressant effect by affecting it particularly in lateral orbitofrontal cortex. Now the interesting thing is that this leads to all sorts of other treatments for the depression. So you have to do something, the theory says, to knock you out of the non-reward um, state, the attractor. And that could involve giving rewards, which tend to be reciprocally related to non-reward in lateral orbitofrontal cortex. Um, it could involve trying to distract people, make them think about more positive things, and so on. So there may be all sorts of treatments, cognitive psychological ones, as well as pharmacological ones, that are suggested by this theory, okay? Um, so it's a totally new way of thinking about it in terms of the stability of cortical circuits. And so we're at early days, but it may open up a new part of psychiatry for depression. Thank you. We have one more question here. I wanted to ask both uh, Ed Rawls and Joe Ledoux about the importance of uh, working memory and prospective memory in uh, anxiety and depression in, uh, in people, of course, uh, in depression and in anxiety you can imagine situation, negative situation, which will never occur. You tend to do that. And, and certainly <clears throat> the feeling is a bad feeling, is a negative feeling, which uh, I suppose is linked to the reward punishment system. You see, in this book I just wrote called Cerebral Cortex, the most fundamental thing I think about cerebral cortex is these local attractor circuits, the local positive feedback. And what does that enable you to do in evolution? It enables you to hold information online in what you describe as short-term memory so that you can, among other things, plan for the future. 
uh, you can have multiple short-term memory systems in the end set up to enable you to do a multiple step planning. So really what I'm saying about depression is that's just a bit of the cortex that happens to be important in non-reward, but it uses the same attractor principle. And if it keeps going for too long, then you're extra depressed. But then I'm saying humans have this syntactic reasoning system, a rational thinking system. And so once the non-reward gets up into that, you can then get that system thinking about it and feeding back down. So I would even suggest that depression might be sort of a worse state in any animal, such as a human, that has the syntactic thoughts um, than animals that don't, okay? Now, when it gets on to consciousness, Joe Ledoux says working memory is something to do with consciousness. So my thoughts are close to that, but sort of go a bit beyond it. So I'm saying um, plan ahead in multiple steps for which you need the short-term memory system. Um, <clears throat> and then if that goes wrong, if the third step in the plan is wrong, you need to have another system that's monitoring it and also uses syntax because there are symbols in every step and can correct the first one. So I'm saying that consciousness might be something to do with this monitoring of what is fundamentally what you're saying, a short-term memory system. So I would actually be really interested to know what Joe Ledoux thinks about this in more detail. So he talked about working memory, but perhaps he would like to expand on how you think the working memory is important in consciousness. So let me first uh, address Giovanni's uh, question. Um, and let me start with uh, distinguishing fear and anxiety. So there are many ways to do this, but I think a traditional one is to distinguish fear as an emotion that occurs when there's an immediately present threat. And anxiety is uh, a worry about the future. You know, as Kierkegaard said, anxiety is the price tag on the freedom to choose of, of the futures that we have. So our ability to anticipate the future is um, both our, it, it allows us to imagine buildings and sculptures and all the wonderful things the human brain can do, but it can also allow us to imagine uh, a bad place or a bad set of circumstances that may come our way, even uh, things that are impossible, as you, as you point out. So a person who is anxious about alien abduction is just as anxious as a person, just their anxiety is just as real as a person who is anxious about um, something terrible happening to their child tomorrow. So um, I think that you're right, the, uh, the ability to envision the future is a key part of, uh, of anxiety. And in fact, in the United States, the DSM is the, you know, the, the Vatican of the uh, uh, psychiatric disorders, and anxiety was almost renamed uh, worry disorder uh, in the latest DSM. So the worry and concern about the future is, is key to uh, anxiety. So turning to Edmund, uh, and what, how I think working memory uh, contributes. Um, so in a theory that I'm developing now with uh, a philosopher named Richard Brown, uh, who was a student of David Rosenthal's, um, and I think this maps onto some of Larry's ideas and yours as well, is that the, um, one of the things that consciousness, that, that may generate consciousness is a higher order thought about a lower order thought. And the traditional Rosenthal view is the higher order thought is about a, a sensory representation uh, being the lower order thought. But what um, Richard Brown and I are proposing is that the higher order thought, uh, sorry, that the lower order thought is actually a working memory representation that is then, re that then requires a second um, uh, re-representation, a higher order thought about the lower order working memory representation. And this is based on the fact uh, that recent research, including uh, work from this Dick Passingham, has shown that working not everything in working memory is conscious. So that you can have non-conscious working memory that then has to be, has to be re-represented in order for consciousness to arise. And so we're proposing that these non-conscious working memory representations are the lower order events that then are re-represented in the higher order thought. But because the higher order thought itself is never conscious, uh, 
then the question is, how do you have the self represented in there as when you have an emotional experience? I would say that, for example, for fear, there is no fear without the self. Um, you, you can't be afraid of something hurting you if you don't exist. So you have to represent the self, and that requires an additional higher order thought. And that's as far as you have to go as those three higher order thoughts uh, to do the whole thing. Um, but that additional higher order thought represents the self. And the difference between a higher order thought about the self in just an abstract sense of, you know, I exist, as opposed to a more um, pressing higher order thought about the self, I exist and I'm, I'm about to die, uh, is, again, goes back to the idea that I talked about earlier, which is the, the information that working memory is working with. What are the other systems in the brain that are active at that moment uh, that are contributing? And if you have a defensive survival circuit that's active, like, say, the amygdala, uh, it's generating brain arousal and body feedback connections from the amygdala directly into cortical areas are creating certain patterns of neural activity there as well. Uh, and so all of these things are coming together and, and making that representation of danger uh, to the self different from the representation of the self itself. So that's what I would say. Thank you. We have time for a couple of more questions. Uh, okay. So thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. I think that this is a day we all will remember. So it's a great opportunity to be here. I have, I'm very much interested in the distinction between feelings and the behavioral and physiological response associated with feelings. And I was thinking whether this also extends to observation of other people. And this is suggested by blindsight. Because in a sense, I was wondering whether uh, what's going on in term, in, with affective blindsight suggests that, that they do not experience the feeling, but they experience the, or they, they, are, they are somehow influenced at the behavioral, physiological level, but the uh, emotion they see in the, other, in, the, in the face of the other person. So whether this distinction between feelings and uh, physiological and behavioral responses extends to observation of other people. It's an interesting question. I, I think the blindside people should address that because I don't really, I've never seen a blindside patient, so I don't have the kind of data that would allow me to address that. Uh, Bea, do you have a, a comment? Uh, okay, she'll talk about it this afternoon, she says. So. <laughs> Marco? Anybody? Well, no, just a minor and, and short reply to this. Well, at least in, in my experience of these patients, uh, they are not reporting when inquired about that, uh, about their feelings. They do not report having any particular feelings. So this seems to be quite in line with what with, with said, said, so that in a way you can have uh, a physiological response which is coherent with, with, with the nature of the stimulus is presented. And, and moreover, this physiological response can guide your, in a way, your own behavior of your own responses, but nevertheless, those changes, the physiological changes, do, do not have access to conscious awareness or to any, do not produce any conscious feeling whatsoever. And in, uh, if I can make a comparison with a very different phenomenon of, of neglect, we, we uh, performed last year, uh, we published last year uh, with Bea uh, using the uh, bodily expressions, uh, a similar experiment uh, with a, in one pay, fMRI experiment in one patient with extinction. And, and we were able to find that when the stimuli were not, uh, were extinguished, they were still producing a physiological response in pupil dilation. But the, at the neuronal level, the amygdala was equally involved when the stimulus was extinguished and when it was consciously perceived. What, what was changing there, specifically for the awareness of the stimulus, was the activation in the insula and the sensory motor Cortices. So that seems to suggest, let's say in, in, in William James' terms, that is not only the presence of your physiological responses that immediately triggers your conscious 
feelings of that emotion. But those changes need to be mapped at a central level. For example, they, they can be mapped at the level of the insula. And mapping the changes going on in your body is certainly helpful in integrating and producing a sort of visual consciousness and also a feeling that, that, that is typical of that emotion. So I have a, a kind of boring technical question for you, Marco. No, it's, it's straightforward. Um, what do we know about DTI uh, sensitivity versus anatomical tracing sensitivity? Yeah. Well, there's quite a lot of, of methodological studies. So n normally th there is a good correspondence between the fibers that, I, that are detected by DTI and the fibers that are really there in axons. Uh, the situation becomes more complicated when you are close to a lesion, for example. Uh, because, I mean, that, that creates some distortion of the signal. Or when the fiber crosses, you are no longer that secure about whether it kisses and so the two fibers go that way or whether they cross. So these are two, two problems. And uh, well, in, in the kind of study that, that I presented, we tried to circumvent as best as we could this, this problem. On the one hand, the lesion in the patient was very far away. So we were tracing fibers and structures. We were miles in brain terms, in brain distances, miles away from the, from the V1 lesion. And then another methodological uh, approach that you can take is that you, you can use deterministic DTI or you can use probabilistic DTI. So uh, deterministic is, is normally more conservative about reporting the existence of a fiber tract. But when it reports, then it's somehow as a, as a positive bias in overestimating the extent. The opposite is, is for probabilistic. So since we were looking for a pathway that was not obvious that we could fine, so we use deterministic to be more conservative toward the existence of the pathway, but we might have been liable to overestimation of the number of fibers. So, I mean, obviously, given my early work on subcortical connections to the amygdala, I'm very, you know, eager for this to be accurate, I'd be correct, but um, it, let's say you have the lack of anatomical tracing evidence, but the presence of DTI. Which one wins the... Which, sorry, say again? Let's say that anatomical tracing evidence in monkeys, for example, hasn't shown the, uh, the lateral pulvinar connection, but the DTI tracing has. Which, which one wins? Anatomic, uh, anatomical tracing wins in the end because that traces real actions. And so far, I know only of one group in Georgetown University who is doing fiber tracing, uh, anatomical tracing in monkeys. And uh, I... I I was at the symposium in, in, um, uh, in Hungary, and they were presented initial findings that seems to be coherent with the anatomical existence of the pathway. But I have no doubt in saying that if we have a disagreement between tracing and DTI, tracing wins. I, I mean, obviously, you, we know very clearly in the auditory system that these connections exist. Sure. I mean, there's clear evidence, and I think that they must probably exist in the visual system, so I hope you can find that. <laughs> Thank you for the hope. Uh, one, we have one more question from the last row, please. Uh, Salim has published a paper. Who? Salim, in which he compared tracing for very many parts and DTI. And there were many DTI false positives. Uh, and so I think we should be worried. So I'm not trying to challenge your data. No, no, sure. I'm just saying there has been and is published a thorough comparison, and it worryingly does suggest uh, false positives. I now, uh, the reply of people like Matthew Rushworth to that is that though Salim says that he's used the best modern methods, they don't think he has. So in other words, their reply is, you can do better than Salim in tracing pathways with DTI. <laughs> Thank you, but I entirely agree with you. I just can add a, in 30 seconds one more piece of evidence uh, that there is um, a Japanese group by Isao Nijiju in Toyama who has published several papers on single cells recordings and uh, in the Caliculus 
and in the pulvinar. And those results seem to support the idea that the two structures are differentially sensitive at very early latencies between uh, facial expressions or between snakes and non-threatening stimuli. So from a very different domain, some uh, animal physiology, those structures seem to be initially sensitive to this difference and in 30, 30 to 40 milliseconds after the presentation of the stimuli, which is unlikely to be derived from back projection from the cortex. So there is still this piece of evidence in, in, in monkeys that it's, it's interesting and it's coherent with what we discussed. responses now in the amygdala, so yeah. it's consistent with the, the subcortical. Yeah. And, and, and a, re a recent paper published a couple of weeks ago by the, a group of people, including Patrick Villomier and Nature Neuroscience, so you are referring to that paper, yeah. Okay, we have, we have 